When Charlotte Sampson and Darren Mack met, there was explosive chemistry and passion. From the outside, they seemed to be living the all-American dream, living a life of luxury and wealth. But when the relationship began to crumble, a bitter divorce would ensue, with the main point of contention being money. Darren found it incredibly unfair that he was ordered to pay Charlotte a large sum of money despite being rich himself. In fact, Darren Mack is a man who couldn't stand to lose. This is what happens when a narcissist doesn't get their own way. This is the murder of Charlotte Mack. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. I will say, if occasionally you hear gurgles and strange noises and bizarre sounds to some degree, it's because I do have my newborn baby just at my feet in a lovely little kind of carry cot thing. But she's just wonderful and I thought I may as well introduce her early to my YouTube channel and to making content for you guys. But like I said, if there are some odd noises, it isn't me. Today's case is one that I think a lot of people will be able to relate to because it's obviously not that we expect to get killed by a spouse or an ex-spouse to be. It's more that I think that the vast majority of us who've been in relationship breakdowns recognize how contentious they can be. And also for those of you who, like me, have been through a divorce, you will be aware of just how acrimonious and bitter they can be at times. And keeping your cool and keeping your head on when you feel that people are acting in an unjust manner around you can be really, really challenging. And even though we're going to be discussing a really extreme case today, the truth is there will be certain aspects that most of us who've experienced the breakdown of a relationship can connect with. So let's look at Darren. So Darren is described by people who knew him as a very handsome and charismatic man. People suggested that as a human being, he had that kind of personality that just makes you want to be around him. He was very strong, he was very muscular, he had a great physique. He actually came fifth in Mr. Nevada bodybuilding contest. So clearly somebody who's very invested in his body, very invested in himself, quite confident. I appreciate that some people go in for bodybuilding competitions to set themselves up with a goal and to make themselves feel that they've got something to work towards positively and it doesn't necessarily translate to them being uber confident. But equally, I do think there are a lot of individuals who go in for those kind of competitions who are absolutely body confident beyond belief. I just want to show it off, maybe with a little bit of gravy browning to make their bumps and grooves stand out. I don't think it is gravy browning. I think I'm going back to kind of the war times there, a time when people used to not be able to afford to have tights, so they used to put gravy browning on the legs. I bet they were popular with the local dogs, if nothing else. Anyway, I digress early. So Darren Mack was born on the 31st of January 1961. He was born in Nevada. He attended Reno High School and he graduated from the University of Nevada. He actually attended that university on a baseball scholarship. So he's clearly an individual who has talent, is an individual who achieves. And I think that, again, that collides with what I was just representing regarding the way he feels about his body. I think he has a natural tenacity in life, a natural tenacity for his endeavours, and he likes to stand out. And I guess that if you're on a baseball scholarship, you would have been popular at university. He came from really positive means. So his family opened a place called the Palace Jewelry and Local Pawn Shop. And he'd actually been working in that business in some capacity since he'd basically been about seven years of age. Now, really sadly, in 1986, his dad was actually killed in a plane crash, which had been 
very traumatic for the family. And obviously, when you are working for the family company and one of the main people within that company loses their life, that's going to cause issues organisationally. But it's also, if you're the son, likely going to put you in a position of responsibility. And that actually happens. Darren inherits half of the pawn shop. He becomes essentially one of the owners. And the family business was worth a lot. It's worth around 10 million dollars at that point and that means that Darren was given access to a life of privilege, life of luxury, extravagance. I think when you talk about a pawn shop no one's thinking about you having a 10 million dollar price tag but that's logistically what happened to him. So he's going to be a popular young man isn't he? I'm not saying for one minute that women are out there absolutely desperately trying to find people who are rich to marry. I don't believe that for one second. Well, maybe some women. There'll be some women who sensibly go after the money. No, obviously, marry for love. But if they're rich, it'll probably help. What I'm saying is that usually what makes somebody attractive is their success, their personality, their charisma, and he has all of that. So I suppose to the outside looking in, he's the full package at this point. So in 1986, Darren Mack marries Deborah Ashlock, or Debbie as she's known, and they go on to have a son, Jory, and a daughter, Jacqueline. So whilst they get married in 1986, they actually get divorced in 1991, and to all intents and purposes, the relationship did not end well. They had to spend a lot of money on legal fees, and I think one of the most troubling parts of the divorce journey is the amount of expenditure, if you don't agree on things, that you have to pay out on solicitor's fees. And that can be incredibly grating and it can also impact on what you each end up with because you're fighting over things that don't get resolved and the consequence is every letter you receive of a solicitor, every time you have to go to court and so on and so forth, is costing you a packet and that actually incites further rage and further problems. So it's this vicious cycle, but it will wound him experientially without a doubt. Mac will realise at this point that getting divorced is a very costly business and also, when we have been through an experience that's relatively traumatic, we have a hardwired memory of that. For anybody who's endured and experienced trauma, you'll be fully aware of how that can feel. And those activators in life that remind us of those challenging times can take us back to that very initial origin of pain. And you want to try in the future to avoid ever returning to those positions. And I'm just outlining that now because clearly if you've had one really quite acrimonious difficult divorce it's been very expensive you're certainly not going to look forward to having another and arguably the way you may react during a subsequent divorce may be different to the original because you understand the collateral damage that occurs and plays out when you are actually engaged in going through that kind of issue the first time so they had spent a lot of cash doing this, but I would say on a positive note, he did actually end up with joint custody of their children. I think that's a positive thing. Obviously, parents deserve both a mother and father in the ideal scenario, and in this consequentially, they were given that. So clearly, even though there are problems in the divorce, they do manage to co-parent to some degree. Now, of course, this means that he's now open to meet somebody else. And that's exactly what happens. He meets Sharla. Now, Sharla Samsel was born on August the 15th, 1966. And people describe her as being a bit of a little pocket rocket. So what she lacked in height, she made up in personality and passion. Her mother said that Sharla was just passionate about the world, that she had, quote, an extraordinary ability to love and take care of people, that she was this incredibly happy, positive person. And she did have a big dream. Her big dream was to become a successful actress. She wanted to be famous. So the motivation behind desiring fame was that she ended up moving to Los Angeles. We all appreciate that when we think about the States, we do think about LA as a place that so many individuals go who want to pursue that kind of career. And she did seem to enjoy some success. So she ended up in a role in a film with Drew Barrymore. She was in the film Poison Ivy with her. And then she had another role in a documentary that Diane Keaton was in. And that was called Heaven. So 
arguably, you know, she was getting her rungs on the ladder, so to speak. But shortly after doing these, she ends up moving back to Reno. I imagine that it's a very difficult situation to get permanent work in any kind of the acting opportunities that are in those places. There's so much competition. And I guess unless you are economically in a glorious situation, it's going to be problematic for you. So I would imagine that money is her main motivation for returning to Reno. Now, Charlotte was somebody who was very determined. So... We are not talking about an individual who thinks small. She thinks big. So she gets involved in the area of nutrition and she's really successful. She ends up leading workshops about nutrition for over 200 people. And this demonstrates, again, she's intelligent, she's vivacious, she's definitely ambitious. She's got determination and commitment to what she wants to do and pursue. And she's good at what she's doing. And she's deeply attractive as well. She's a very attractive young woman. So again, we're talking about somebody from the outside looking in who again has everything going for them. They are the full package. And she actually ends up meeting Darren when there's this dinner held for the course leaders which had done a seminar in nutrition and he's there. And he basically attended those seminars because he wanted to self-improve. He was motivated to think about how to better himself. and. Obviously, she stands out and he stands out. And when there are really two attractive people in a place, they're going to potentially be drawn to each other because there are similarities between the two of them. So it doesn't take very long for them to connect and essentially very quickly they fall in love. And it doesn't take them long to fall in love. In fact, they get married in May 1995, which is not very long after him getting divorced the first time. So the scars and battle wounds of that experience obviously aren't pertinent in his mind when he's thinking about marrying at Charlotte. And this gives us an understanding that Darren Mack is somebody who maybe has an impulsivity quality about him. Realistically, if you've just been dealing with the wounds and the economic fallout of getting divorced, why would you rush in to another marriage? For me personally, I think that's short-sighted. And I think, again, it speaks to a lack of control over decision making on his part. They initially, as far as people who look into their situation, give everybody an impression that they're just super happy. They really do. To the world outside, they just seem so connected. Charlotte had actually started working with Darren Mack and people said they just had this undeniable, visible chemistry. There was something about them that one person commented on who was a friend of theirs that made them explosive together and that Charlotte Mack was somebody who really fired Darren Mack up. She was somebody who really inspired him. And you can imagine at that lustful stage of a relationship, which, you know, think back to your lustful days in your relationship. <laughs> yes, they may be relatively temporary, but during that period of time, you suffer from a lump sickness, which is pretty monumental. You can only think about that person, everything that you do begins, middles and ends with that person, the person that you go to sleep thinking about, person you wake up in the morning thinking about, because it's a connecting experience. And they get married fast, they're now working together, they're spending all their time together, and at the moment that people are looking into that scenario playing out, it looks like it's working really effectively. But the word explosive is an interesting one. Because a lot of us will have seen our friends fall in love. A lot of us will have fallen in love. The word explosive, it conjures up, yes, passion. It conjures up, yes, chemistry indeed. But just as in chemistry, there can be elements that mix together that are catastrophic. And the word explosive, I think, can be related to their relationship on this level along with the positive suggestions that are related to it on this level. Also, that passion that they had, because they are both allegedly very sexual people, they both enjoy intimacy, they're both very, shall we say, liberal in their attitudes towards sex. They had a real lack of inhibition in the sexual area, and this meant that they kind of went to strip clubs together, they were also swingers. Now, I'm sure that most of you know what swingers are, but if you don't, perchance you've stumbled across my channel with an innocent idea about the world and you're thinking right now that I'm talking about swingers in the context of maybe dancing. I'm not. 
Not the kind of dancing that you'd be thinking of anyway. So swingers are people who go to, shall we say, parties, clubs, where the main focus is that they can enjoy extra people within their sexual relationship, whether that's in their couple, introducing other individuals to them as a couple, or whether it's swapping partners. In the 1970s, I believe people used to put car keys in a bowl and whoever picked out the car key would be matched with the person who owned the car. One can imagine the disappointment on some people's faces when one person picks out the Bentley car key and the other the Metro Miami. That would have been mine at a certain time. Metro Miami, disappointing car, would have been very disappointing for the person selecting that too back in the day. Anyway, they had this open marriage and they would go to parties together, they would go to conventions together, so they're really invested in this. And everybody has got their own opinion of this. I will tell you I've done research in the area of swinging and people do have positive stories. I will also note that it can be something that really fractures confidence. Often there is one individual who wants to be involved in an open situation or a swinging situation more than the other. And initially a lot of partners will want to please their partner and so arguably they'll go ahead with a particular interest that they may not really be that connected towards. Not saying it's the same in this situation, I'm just saying that is my experience and I think it can be really difficult to manage psychologically. Now the couple end up having a daughter, Erica, they have her in December 1997, so again, relatively soon after they get married, they've got a child, we've got to think about the incremental stress impact of that because it can be problematic for certain individuals, and there does seem to be a change for Charlotte at this point. She decides that she wants to stop swinging, she wants a more stereotypical life for her daughter, she wants her daughter to grow up feeling that as a couple, their parenting comes first. And so I think she fits that typology of somebody who's a pleaser and she's probably going to the swinging clubs and investing in that sexual area because Darren Mack is very invested in it himself. And so she doesn't want to let him down. And then she goes through the sacred transcendental experience of having a baby. And all of a sudden she's thinking to herself, this isn't for me. I don't want my daughter to grow up thinking that I'm okay sharing myself with other men and other women when actually my main priority and concern should be sharing my life with her. So she goes through a change and arguably Darren Mack might be annoyed with this because they've been invested in this area together. Now she's withdrawing her support and that might be a kink and a turn on that he doesn't want to give up. The idea that she has is that if they stop swinging he will commit fully to her. And she clearly doesn't feel that that's happening with the fracturing in relationships because of the connection with other individuals. She'd become really tired of that lifestyle and it didn't go down well with Darren Mack at all. And it seems that it's at this point their relationship really becomes quite turbulent. Now, that's going to be most likely down to the fact that they're going to be arguing about the mismatch, a misstep to some degree in their relationship now. Darren Mack wants to swing, he wants to share partners, he wants to have an open relationship, and Charles feels the absolute opposite. So that point of contention is going to be there consistently. And whenever they get stressed, whenever they get angry, they're going to be throwing that stuff back at one another. Darren Mack will be entitled as far as he's concerned because she's the one who's changed the game now. She's the one who's decided she's not satisfied with the life that they've been sharing so far and arguably she's gone through probably the most spiritual experience ever of having a baby, and now she doesn't see sex and relationships in the same way whatsoever. So they're both entitled to that point of view, and we can have absolute sympathy and empathy with both points of view, but as opposed to it making them connect further and more fully, it seems to be driving a wedge between them. And friends and family noticed a real change. They said that they would see them relatively regularly screaming at each other and that the marriage had basically gone from idyllic to just entirely toxic. And Darren actually kept a diary, which is interesting because he used to note his feelings about Charlotte. So he was writing in his diary suggesting that she was abusing him, 
saying that Charlotte was somebody who, quote, belittled him and shouted at him in front of his friends, had tried to kick him in the balls, scratched his car. So Darren Mack actually wrote that he was really afraid of her. In an interview, in fact, one of his friends, Michael Small, agreed that Darren Mack had actually been threatened by Sharla. He said that Mack feared for his life and he was really scared. And one can also match that with other reports that Sharla was afraid of Mack. And she actually told one of her friends that in one instance, he'd actually held her by the neck and was attempting to strangle her. And remember, this guy is a big guy. He's muscular, he takes care of himself, he's a gym bunny. The idea of him grabbing a very petite woman by the neck, it wouldn't take too much force for him to actually snuff a life out. And we have to remember that. So I think that the mismatch between their size is problematic when it comes down to his fear. I understand that in situations of coercive control, we've seen men who are big, strong, muscular men be absolutely dominated by the female party to a point where their life is just impacted horribly. But what I'm saying in this scenario is, we've got somebody like Darren Mack who is incredibly competent, incredibly self-aware as far as what his strength is like. That's why he's entering competitions. And also we're in a situation where we've got this petite partner of his who might be a roaring bitch at times because you know everybody tends to in their relationship show themselves to be their worst in moments. But arguably the disparity is that if she put her hands around his neck, it's highly unlikely she'd even be able to get them around it. Whereas for him, one hand and he could basically throttle her it's as simple as that and in fact the fact that he's got her by the neck and he's attempted to strangle her that's terrifying so darren mack ends up moving out of the family home in february 2005 and at this point charlotte actually files for divorce now we go back essentially at this point to the way that he responds and reacts to the first divorce so money is something that really annoys him it's something that really stresses him out. It's something he wants to hold on to and he genuinely does not enjoy it or like it when the control is taken away from him, which happens in divorce. You have no control whatsoever. There are solicitors dealing with all of those things and suddenly there is a level of powerlessness and helplessness psychologically. So they start arguing about these divorce proceedings and Darren Max basically cut off Sharla financially and also fired her, which is something that makes absolutely no sense. First of all, if you have a child together, you're actually cutting off the child financially as much as you're cutting off the mother. So it would be far better for you to be somebody who actually does an effective job of supporting your ex and supporting your ex's child because that is a unifying point. If you're kind to them, if you don't try to make it difficult for them, then they're going to want you to see your child. They're going to want to support that endeavour. They're also going to raise you up and be positive about who you are. So there won't be reputational damage because you're taking care of them. But if you do the opposite, you cut them off financially and then you sack them, literally cutting their financial opportunity off at source, all you're going to do is inflame an already challenging situation and that is likely going to translate to the way that your child feels about you. Now, obviously, when you are going through a divorce, particularly when there are custody battles and you're engaged in that kind of conflict, you often turn to the courts. In one way, that's positive because it's taken out of your hands. In another, massively expensive, usually contentious, and obviously everyone thinks they're the victim in their story, which can often lead to even more amplified issues in the breakdown in the relationship. Now, Chuck Weller was the judge that was actually presiding over the family court case where these two are concerned, and he said that Darren Mack should basically pay Charla around $10,000 a month until the divorce was settled. Bearing in mind, Darren Mack is paying her nothing, has literally cut her off at the source, and she's now not got a job, so she would be in financial dire straits, and she's bringing up one of his kids. So, this is not going to be positive for Darren Mack. He is not going to want to hear this kind of siding, in his opinion, with his ex-to-be. But 
Darren Mack was making more than four times this amount monthly. So let's just say it's not like he's going to be using food banks. It's not that he's got an issue financially. It's just he doesn't want her to have anything. So he's taking out on her the breakdown in their mutual relationship, blaming her for the fact that now he's going to have to pay for her and feeling angered by the logistics of how the law works, which is unfair because this is just a reality. He made the decision to put a ring on it and the consequence of that is now financially you have to take care of your ex. Now, Darren Mack finds this massively unjust. But if you think about somebody who's got quite a narcissistic personality, they are gonna see a judge making a fair decision like this as completely and profoundly unfair because they want everything for themselves. That's how narcissists operate. So he became really angry at the court system and he was very upset that Charlotte was gonna receive this large proportion of his money, felt enraged, and he actually decided that the way he was going to retaliate in this situation was to not make the payments, which when it has been judged by a court that you should, is not going to play out well for you at all. And Darren Mack went so far as to show his grievances to the world because he actually spoke to the media and he said that there were lots of people like him that, quote, had fallen prey to Chuck Weller's tyranny and abuse. Just going to throw it out there, Mr. Mack probably not the best idea to go out and just be really disrespectful about the judge presiding over the family court case involving you, money and child. Because these are not going to leave you in a good light. But nonetheless, when it comes down to Darren Mack, Darren Mack does what Darren Mack wants to do. And he actually said that he felt he was being treated in a really unjust way. Well, I'm going to throw it out there that maybe the reason that you're being treated this way is because you are literally not maintaining your ex-to-be who is the mother of your child financially you're refusing to pay and you believe that you are above the law you might not like it but you don't get to be above it but he didn't get the memo on that he just went down the i'm a victim this is unjust that judge is a wrong gun kind of way we get to May 2006, and this is when Judge Weller goes ahead and gives joint custody to Darren Mack and to Charlotte. So clearly this judge is not somebody who's massively biased. It's not like, Darren Mack, you will pay all of this childcare, you will pay all of this alimony, and you will also never see your child again. I'd kind of get it if that was the reality. I'd be like, okay, he's making it so that he doesn't get access to his child because that would be pivotal and that would be primary and somebody's concern you'd imagine as a parent. But it doesn't feel like that happens at all. Judge Weller allows them both to have 50-50 custody. So Erica will spend a week with Darren Mack and also a week with her mother, Sharla. He's also at this point told to pay Sharla $480,000 and he had to make monthly payments of $10,000 on top of this for over two years. I do appreciate it's a lot of money, get it? But when you're really rich, this is the kind of price tag that happens in divorce because the person is seen to need to be accustomed to a lifestyle and therefore that lifestyle needs to be mirrored to some degree in the way that they get to live after the divorce. So his wealth and also her working for him means that essentially she's got used to a certain kind of lifestyle. And even though obviously her lifestyle is going to drop a little, it's not going to be completely unrecognizable to how it was when she was married to him. So those payments make sense, whether he likes it or otherwise. Also, he had to pay over $15,000 back from the missed monthly of payments that he was meant to have been paying Charlotte. Again, that's fair. He's chosen not to pay and therefore, it's now getting validated by the judge that he has to do so, he has to make amends. But again, none of that is shocking. All of the things I've just said to you is really normal in these scenarios. And like I said, Darren Mack is incredibly wealthy, he is well-connected, he is not struggling financially, and therefore this needs to be represented where Sharla is concerned. We get to June the 12th, 2006, and this is where things start to slide. So we have Dan Osborne. Now, Dan Osborne is actually a friend and an employee of Darren Mack. He meets Darren Mack at his home that particular morning. Now, Sharla, she arrived during that visit because she's dropping off the daughter, Erica. This is at 9 a.m. Now, Darren Mack and Sharla basically spoken privately. This is while Dan and Erica were also upstairs. Erica then says to Dan that his dog was barking. So... 
Erica kind of alerts Dan and says, look, the dog's barking. And Dan thinks, well, what's going on? So Dan then goes to check on his dog because clearly you're like, what is happening to my dog? It's how all good dog owners are. We're like, we're not really concerned about anything or anyone else in that moment, but why is our lovely dog barking? At this point, he bumps into Darren and apparently it was weird because Darren kind of brushes past him and doesn't speak to him. And that wouldn't be the way that he would normally act. And also he notices that Darren Mack's hand is actually wrapped in a towel. But then what really shocks Daniel is he looks at his dog and he notices that his dog is literally covered in blood. But he looks for the injury because clearly he's thinking, what on earth has happened to my dog? Who do I need to attack in retaliation to my dog being harmed? But actually his dog's completely uninjured. And it really grates on his mind. He can't help but think there's something really odd happening here. So Dan is actually really spooked at this point and he ends up driving away with Erica and with his dog. But then he gets a really weird phone call and it's from Darren Mack and he's asking him to go and meet him for a Starbucks. Well, Dan obviously has Erica and at the end of the day, Darren's his boss and his friend and he's asked him to go for a Starbucks. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna go? So Dan obviously agrees to this. And then when they all meet, Darren Mack speaks to Erica for a little while, but then he again just drives away, but without his daughter. So he's literally left Erica. And this is all feeling really strange for Daniel, who's actually looking in and looking at what's just happened and how it's played out and the fact his dog was covered in blood. Nothing's making sense. But equally, he doesn't ask what's gone on and he doesn't know what's gone on. I'm the kind of person, if my dog was covered in blood and my dog wasn't cut, I'd either be thinking, I hope my chihuahua hasn't gone and savage someone and that's their blood. You know, I'd be asking questions like, where has this blood come from? Is my dog experiencing the stigmata? Do I need to call the Vatican to make sure that potentially my dog is some kind of miracle that needs canonizing in the future? Just saying, I wouldn't be like, oh, my dog's covered in blood. I just won't talk about it. But obviously for Dan, things are on his mind, but he's not saying anything at this point. Now that same day, so this is about 11 a.m., it turns out that there was another strange occurrence and that's a shooting in Reno, but it's who that's got shot that's really shocking. So Judge Weller, the judge who's presiding over the family court case, he gets shot in the chest. But not just shot in the chest randomly, as in he's walking down the street, there's some kind of random attack, just happens out of the blue. We're talking about something that was clearly highly premeditated and planned because Judge Weller is shot in the chest in his chambers. So first off, that's a shoot to kill. Somebody is actively trying to make sure that you die. There is no way that shooting somebody in the chest ends well on the whole. And also, during that shooting, his assistant had actually been sprayed with shards of glass, so they got injured as well. The bullet had actually shattered a window. And because the bullet had gone through a window, and because it had shattered in a way that it had shattered, and because the shards had gone in a certain direction, etc., the ballistics of that shot actually means that they can determine it more easily as to where it came from. So they thought that the shot had come from the direction of the car park across the street. So that's where they believe it had arrived from. And again, that means that somebody likely was very good with a gun and somebody likely knew that that individual was their target and the whole premise of that target was to completely take them out, i.e. kill them. Now, Chuck Weller, the judge is taken to hospital. He's in a critical condition. So this is really touch and go as to whether he survives. At this point, um, police arrive. They're moving people off the street because they don't know whether this is one of those shooters that's come to actually take out lots of different targets. They don't know specifically whether it's a hit on Judge Weller or whether this is a random lone shooter who's intending to kill many more people. But it comes to light later on that only one bullet was actually fired. But that one bullet, how precise? And what does that say about the person who shot Judge Weller? It says that firstly, they were skilled, adept at shooting. But secondly, they were confident enough in their skills to believe that they would likely kill the individual they hit with that bullet. That one 
bullet. Now later, Daniel, who we know has had this really weird experience with his dog and the fact that Erica, Darren Mack's daughter, is left, etc. He's feeling unnerved. So he ends up informing the police what had happened that particular morning because it felt odd and off. So the police feel that with this information, they need to go and search Darren Mack's home. Now, going back to Daniel, who's obviously seen this really weird situation play out in the morning, dog covered in blood, etc. He's had some time to think about it. And he's thinking to himself, I am not happy with what I have seen. I think that something really weird has happened. I'm not feeling comfortable with Darren Mack and potentially why my dog was covered in blood and why he left his daughter. Potentially something bad has happened. And obviously he wants to speak to the police about that because he doesn't want to be somebody who's complicit in anything that's terrible. So he ends up going and telling the police what had occurred that particular morning. So the police think at this moment in time, well, that sounds very weird. And they decide that they're gonna go and do a search at Darren Mack's home, but they don't actually get to go initially. There is a delay on when they turn up there because of this shooting and everybody, it's all boots on street because they wanna make sure that there isn't some kind of street shooter out trying to murder innocent people. Now, when they do arrive, at Darren Max, straight away, they find three drops of blood on the driveway. So instantly the hackles are up. They're thinking to themselves, this feels like something very bad might have played out. And then they get to the garage and they look in the garage and that's when they see Sharla Max's body. And she was actually curled up in the fetal position. And when they look at her body, they can tell that she's been stabbed and she'd actually been stabbed seven times. Now, most of the stab wounds as well, they were inflicted on her neck. And if you think about the carotid artery, if you think about the damage to the neck area that seven wounds would actually create, you're talking about a repetitive motion in a repetitive area. And you think about that is absolutely an injury that's intended to kill. You're almost decapitating a person when you're using that kind of force in that area. And the murder weapon was a double-edged knife. So they also find that. And they also find firearm ammunition. Bear in mind, when they actually look at this firearm ammunition and they explore it, it's linked to the bullet used to shoot Judge Weller. Bang to rights, basically. Not only have they got a dead body of an ex-wife-to-be in the garage, on the floor, in Darren Mack's home, they've now connected the very bullet that was shot into Judge Weller's chest, also present. They're dealing with somebody who is skilled at killing and is willing to kill, essentially. It's as simple as that. They also find a to-do list. And this list is really malevolent. So it included end problem. So obviously we're talking about Charlotte and Judge Weller there, aren't we? End problem. Also referred to a parking garage. We know that Judge Weller was shot from a parking garage. And also listed the weapons that you would need to carry out the crimes. Incredibly incriminating, of course it is. But the other thing that is really important here is what does that say? It says it is premeditated. This is not a crime of passion. This is not somebody losing their mind in a moment. It's not excusable when that happens, but we understand it more. This is premeditated. It's a cool, cold execution. And he knew what was coming because he was the one listing what was next to come. So we have this premeditation level now. Like I said, we have a dead body. We have almost another death, which is Judge Weller. And he also had in that garage a receipt for a rental silver Ford Explorer. And that Ford Explorer was evidence linked to him shooting Judge Weller. Because on CCTV footage, they found a silver Ford Explorer was present at the parking garage opposite Judge Weller's chambers. So like I said, bang to rights. And that particular vehicle, it only entered the garage 20 minutes before Judge Weller was shot. And Darren Mack, the thing about him is he is adept at shooting. He'd been a very experienced hunter. So even though to you and me, arguably the idea of shooting somebody from across the road, from a garage and getting the actual victim hit where you want to get them hit, 
that would feel almost impossible. But Darren was an adept hunter, so he'd been able to make that shot across the street. So that car actually entered just 20 minutes before Judge Weller was shot. And also, going back to the shot itself, you know, clearly this is somebody who's experienced. And the reality is that Darren Matt fits that bill because he was an incredibly adept hunter. So even though to most of us, the idea of being able to shoot somebody from across the street would be all but impossible, for somebody like Darren Mack, it would be probable because he had so much experience. So hitting Judge Weller in the chest would be something that he would find relatively easy, even under stress. And again, the cool, calm, calculated reality of what he did to achieve that goal, the planning, the premeditating, the driving there, knowing that he could just turn around, knowing that there was time to change his ways, change his decision. The fact that he rented a hire car to hopefully distract people from the fact that it was him. All of these things demonstrate an incredibly malevolent mindset. Somebody who'll do anything to get what they want. And that's so powerful, again, when you think about a narcissist and how we are aware of the way a narcissist operates. It's about self-interest. It's about self-gain. It's about eradicating or removing the obstacles in your way at any cost, however you achieve your goal. And like I said earlier, Darren Mack is somebody who is goal-orientated. We can have positive ones, we can have deeply dark goals too. And one of the things that his lawyer actually later said about Darren Mack is that he was a really difficult client. He was somebody that always wanted to call the shots. And I guess this is evident because when you think about what he's done, not only has he resorted to murdering his ex-wife, but he's also attempted to murder Judge Weller. Why? Because he didn't get his way. That's it. The only motivation. He didn't get his way in the family court settlement and he was bitter about it. He was salty about that. To such a degree, he thought, I'm going to get control back. I'm not going to feel helpless. I'm not going to allow other people to tell me what I need to do, who I need to pay. It's not happening. So literally for him, it was more positive as a mindset, as a belief, as a concept to actually think about assassinating Judge Weller and murdering his ex-wife. I mean, how does somebody get to a point where that seems like the better option than paying? You still got all of this money. You aren't going to be broke. You're not going to be living on the streets. You're not going to be eating from bins. None of that's going to happen because you were in a privileged position. But you think that that money that you've got to pay your ex to be, that is more significant than a life. And in this case, in two lives. And one of the things that I would say we were all aware of on this channel is that husbands do murder their wives. It happens. Wives murder their husbands less, but it happens. Like, especially when they're going through a divorce because large sums of money are involved. So to some degree, I can say that that is not too uncommon. But when it comes down to Darren Mack making the decision that he was going to actually kill the judge who was just doing his job, that's extremely rare. Now, this is probably from a perspective psychologically of Darren Mack wanting to punish the judge because he didn't side with him, wanting him to show him who's in control now, wanting him to feel demasculated, wanting him to feel less than, because then it means that Darren Mack would feel for a moment more than. All of these are really powerful players, potentially, in the way that Darren Mack is acting. And also, he would have managed to get rid of one of the most integral, important parts of this story. He would have got rid of Sharla. And not only now would he be in a better financial position, he wouldn't have the added burden of having to share Erica, his daughter, with Sharla. He would be fully in control. And again, a narcissist likes being in control. And a narcissist likes financial security as well. These are all things that we see play out in these kind of crimes time and time again when a perpetrator truly is a narcissist. Now, in the following days after Charlotte's murder and Judge Weller's attempted murder, Darren Mack's daughter actually goes into hiding. And we have Judge Weller, who's fortunately survived. He's recovering from his gunshot wound. He actually does go on to make a full recovery, thank goodness. But 
he was traumatized by the incident. So arguably he's going to live with the scars mentally forever. And Darren Mack at this point is on the run, but it speaks volumes to me that his daughter is literally in hiding, that she clearly doesn't trust that her father can be trusted. And she probably thinks that there is a possibility that something bad might happen to her. That's a horrible reality, isn't it? To actually take stock and think, could my dad actually do this to me? Could my dad harm me in some awful way? And even though she's young, these things would be playing through her mind. Now, when Darren Mack is on the run, lots of people actually fear for their lives. This is including Charlotte's new boyfriend, because no one knows where Darren Mack is. And everyone knows now that he's somebody who has violence within him and knows how to kill people because he's done this on two occasions, one successfully, one unsuccessfully, but only slightly unsuccessfully. He's clearly very skilled being a sniper. So you're gonna be looking over your shoulder 24 seven in those moments. Now the FBI start looking for him straight away. They're actually trying to find him in Mexico. They're looking for him in a resort in San Jose del Cabo because there've been some potential sightings have been reported there. And one of the reasons that they think he might be there is that Darren Mack had attended that particular resort for a swingers convention. But unfortunately, when they go and search, they didn't find him. A week after the murder, Mack actually calls the district attorney, Richard Gamick. And Richard Gamick, ironically, happens to be a family friend of Darren Mack. And he tells him that he basically wants to surrender. And then we have David Chesnoff and Scott Freeman who become part of Darren Mack's legal team and they start to help with the surrender negotiations. Now, in the communications during this negotiation, Darren Mack literally tries to imply that he's a martyr of the divorce industry for the fathers. Yes, he's a veritable Joan of Arc, just standing there in the glow of the heavenly light, being the martyr. You know, like somehow murdering your ex and almost killing the judge who was presiding over your family court case makes you the victim. Yeah, I am Darren Mack. I'm a massive victim. Why are you a victim? Because I killed my ex-wife-to-be and also tried to kill the judge who was fairly in this situation, trying to divide our assets. That wouldn't necessarily make you a victim. I'm a victim. I'm more than a victim. I'm a martyr. Genuinely, people like Darren Mack are so narcissistic, they genuinely do think that they are victims and they genuinely will see themselves as martyrs. If it doesn't go their way, it's absolutely that they are being ostracized and villainized by individuals who are dark and malevolent in their souls and hearts. It's got nothing to do with them being absolute murderous bastards whatsoever. And I particularly like this quote. He actually said, remember, they want me as a sacrificial lamb. I mean, Mr. Mack, I don't think they do want you as a sacrificial lamb. They do. They want to sacrifice me like they would a lamb. I think they just probably want to try you in a court of law for murdering your ex-wife-to-be and also trying to take out a judge, which is never a good idea. Lamb, I'm a lamb, I'm a sacrificial lamb, end of. Personally, I'm just throwing it out there that I've rarely seen a sacrificial lamb driving a hire car after planning to be a sniper taking out somebody in the judiciary. It doesn't really make sense to me that that would be somebody who is actually sacrificial. In it. Well, they would be sacrificing other people. That's what they, they would be the sacrificer in this scene where the lamb is concerned. The lamb would still die. It's unfortunate, but that would happen. He also says that they want the pleasure of executing me. I'm gonna throw it out there. There will be a few people who would like to have you executed, particularly Judge Weller, I would imagine. But you can see the victim mentality. He's carried out the most gruesome, brutal execution of his ex-wife. It's as simple as that. That's what he did. He stabbed her repeatedly with a double-edged knife in the neck. That's the mother of his child. But somehow she is the person who's the perpetrator. And now he's even considering the judge who is not even invested in the case aside from doing what's right and fair, whether he agrees with it or otherwise. And he believes that that individual, who he's almost killed, is a perpetrator. This is how narcissists interplay their world 
everybody is a perpetrator. They are always the victim, even when what they're doing is absolutely reprehensible, absolutely inexcusable. And at this point, his legal team actually said he may need a psychiatric assessment. Yes, he may, but not for the reasons that his legal team are going to be one in one, because you know what's going to happen here, isn't it? They're going to be thinking to themselves, well, maybe we can act like he wasn't in his right mind. Well, I'm thinking he probably was because he managed to do a series of pretty technical steps, including literally shooting somebody from a car park on the opposite side of the road successfully. It doesn't sound, I don't know, chaotic. It sounds pretty pre-planned and executed effectively. Just throwing in my two penneth. Anyway, we get to June 22nd, 2006. Finally, Darren Mack is found. And this is around this luxury resort in Puerto Vallarta. This is where he is actually staying. This is where he surrenders himself because obviously there's been these four days of negotiation, meaning that Darren Mack is finally apprehended. And when they actually bring him into custody, they find out that he's got $36,000 on him. He also had lots of credit cards. So he'd clearly intended, at least initially, to avoid incarceration because he was planning to be able to have money available to him on a consistent basis. Also, when they go in his suitcase, they find shoes with Charlotte's blood on them. Now, why he's taken them, who knows? Maybe it's a memento because he feels like she deserved to die. Maybe it's just that he needed to take them with him because they were covered in blood. Maybe he feels that there'll be some incriminating evidence on them so he wants to avoid detection. For all those reasons, there's a possibility, but arguably this links him again to the fact that he has knowingly taken his wife's shoes that are now covered in blood, her blood, and he's actually taken them and put them in his suitcase, so connecting him once again to the scene of the crime. We get to the trial. This is when Darren Mack is actually having to be tried in Las Vegas, because clearly you can't be tried in the area where you literally tried to kill the judge, because essentially there's going to be a bias the other judges are going to be like um i think we're just not going to have a not going to have a trial i think we do need to have a trial no 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 all of us judges have got together we've decided that in this case in darren mack's case we're not going to have a trial so what what are you going to do we're going to change the law and the law is going to say that if you happen to knowingly and in a planned way try to execute one of us you just bypass all of the legalities that are required to normally try a perpetrator and we're just going to send you to the rack and to the stocks and to the torture chamber and then after that we're going to keep you in a cell in perpetuity in this universe and all universes forever and we're just going to feed you a diet of stale bread and probably salt water we're thinking that not sure that's going to be okay. I think we're probably just going to try it elsewhere. We're going to try it somewhere else because we feel that even though you have a right to those feelings, it's probably not legally sound. Maybe he'll win at appeal. Anyway, that's why they obviously don't want to try it in that area. Now, during the trial, Darren Mack actually says, listen, I'm the victim. It wasn't me who started this situation. Of course it wasn't, Darren, Matt. Of course it wasn't. It was definitely Charlotte, wasn't it? That's the way he plays this. So he says there was an altercation between the two and he just acted in self-defence. And allegedly, he says, and the defence put forward, that when Charlotte arrives on the morning of the murder, she'd been really verbally abusive to Darren Mack. And when he turned away, Charlotte punches him in the back of the head. Then... There's this altercation that happens between the two of them and it's claimed that Darren falls over as a result of this and then he drops his gun, which he just happens to carry routinely. You know, I'm just routinely carrying my firearm just on the off chance that somebody might get in my way and I'll get to, I don't know, shoot them in the chest or something. But arguably that's what he says. He drops his gun, Charlotte picks it up and then she tries to fire it at him. And he remembers this clearly in picture perfect detail because it is quite amazing how he remembers this. So apart from the fact that she's now punched him in the head and allegedly it seems that she's become an incredibly powerful individual of great strength because she's actually really petite, but not in this moment. No, that 
bang in the back of the head, obviously renders him all but unconscious and he ends up on the floor. Then suddenly this firearm that he's carrying is dropped, even though he's just meant to be carrying it on his belt as opposed to in his hands. And then she, in this instant, picks it up, points it at him, tries to fire it at him, smiles as she pulls the trigger. Yeah, I mean, this is in detail, isn't it? So he actually, in all of this madness and this chaos, in this moment of being under threat of his life, she smiles at him, pulls the trigger, but then the gun doesn't go off. So as opposed to at this moment in time, Darren Mack thinking, well, this is a perfect opportunity. I'm not dead. I can now prevent this woman by physically restraining her from ever harming me because he's a big guy. He decides in his wisdom instead that he's going to stab her several times in the neck, which is clearly the most obvious course of action. Of all the things he could have done in that moment, that seems like the right one. And then apparently... Darren Matt decides after stabbing her in the neck several times that the gun that will have lots of incriminating evidence from Sharla because she's the one who smiled in some kind of a weird horror movie way as she was about to kill him by shooting him with that gun. He decides he will throw it away. I'm just going to throw it away. Are you going to throw it away though? Because that's got the incriminating evidence which is going to support the story about your ex-wife to be actually threatening you and trying to kill you. Yes, that all makes sense. But I'm going to throw it away. Where? Just somewhere. Somewhere where the gun will never be found. I kid you not. That's literally what he decides is going to be his defence. Now, the defence then go on to actually say that when he shot Judge Weller, you know, when he plans to shoot Judge Weller, when he hires a car to shoot Judge Weller, when he drives to the garage that he's clearly scoped out for a potential place to shoot Judge Weller, and then when he physically actually does shoot Judge Weller, that he's basically insane. I mean, it sounds massively insane, doesn't it? Who, when they are insane, manages to go through such steps with such absolute detail and also effectiveness. Apparently, Darren Mack. When Darren Mack is insane, he's actually incredibly, incredibly efficient. Said no insane person ever, nor any expert trying to claim insanity, but the defence are going with it. Simple as that. And they actually said that one of the motivations for Darren Mack shooting Judge Weller is that the judge had fed into Darren's delusions. Yes, Judge Weller, it's your fault, you absolute terrible human being, for feeding into the delusions of this madman who has shot you with absolute care and attention to a point where very few other people could do it. But never mind, you're a terrible human being for actually giving Charla what she was entitled to. But that's what they're going with, that again, Judge Weller is a perpetrator in this. They even indicated that Darren Mack believed that Charlotte, his ex to be, had slept with Judge Weller and that they were colluding together and creating this situation where she was benefiting massively, he was losing out, and this is because she's primarily having sex with Judge Weller. And the defense used this to say, there you go, Darren Mack believed that Charlotte was sleeping with Judge Weller, so therefore he's definitely insane. He thinks this has happened. This makes it clear that he was delusional and was not in use of his faculties when he actually went ahead and did what I've described. Now, the problem when the defence create this kind of scenario is the jury are going to be looking for a victim. It's as simple as that. You know, it does happen that people are genuinely insane when they carry out horrible situations. It does happen that an individual is dealing with a series of delusions. They're in a psychotic break. These things play out in reality. It's rare, but they play out in reality. But what you're going to be looking at as a jury is, what does this person come across like? And the thing about Darren Matt is, he is so superior and arrogant that in my view, he's not a believable victim, even though he is up for murder at this moment in time. The point is, he's not a believable victim in this story. He's actually somebody who looks like and seems like and sounds like a perpetrator and sounds now like a perpetrator who's basically trying to get out of what he's done. So taken no responsibility, no accountability, and most importantly, showed absolutely no remorse, which is what a court and a jury are always looking for. He also says that he loved Charlotte 
as deeply as a man could love a woman. I don't think that's true, Mr. Mac. I really don't. Number one, I think if you love somebody, I don't know, I'm just going to throw it out there, you don't kill them. Secondly, you still wanted to swing when she wanted to be a committed family. So is it that you loved her as deeply as any man could love a woman? Or is it that you loved her quite a bit, but not enough to not stop having sex with other random women? It's going to make it more legitimate as a statement. And he then adds insult to injury by describing the events of the day as a tremendous tragedy. It was tremendous tragedy. It was, it was not a tremendous track. I mean, it was for the family, but you happened to be the perpetrator. It wasn't a tremendous tragedy. It was a premeditated assault and murder. That's what happened. And he even tries to evoke sympathy by basically becoming really emotional on the stand. And he said that a lot of people don't recognise that I lost a wife too. Again, can we just inject the correct terminology? I murdered my wife. That's how the statement should have gone. And he also said that his daughter had lost her mother and his other kids had lost a stepmother who they loved. They hadn't lost her. She's not wandering around Costco wondering whether she's going to get a discount on chocolate cake. That's not happening. She's not lost. She's murdered. You murdered her. You killed her. The kids have lost a parent and a step-parent because you decided that financially you wanted to have more money and you didn't want the hassle of having an ex so you killed her you know it's unbelievable how narcissistic can this individual be all he does is talk like he's the victim and it's unbelievable when you consider the circumstances i've described i mean he is as far from being a victim as is possible when you think about charlotte's murder she was killed brutally they say that she was dragged across the floor she had defensive wounds to her arms and her legs and when the prosecution start their case, they said, listen, Charlotte did not stand a chance against Darren Mack. She was five foot four. She was 120 pounds. Darren was six foot, 200 pounds. The idea that this man was needing to defend himself in the way he's talked about, it's not believable to a lot of people. And I will be honest with you, it's not believable to me at all. This does not mean that men who are bigger cannot be coercively or violently controlled. It happens. I'm saying in that moment, when you are dealing with life or death, is it believable that a six foot man could not overpower a five foot four woman in a way that meant that she escaped the situation, albeit that she'd made mistakes building into that scenario with her life? She could, because all he would need to do is restrain her physically. She would never have been a match for him. And also, in my opinion, it's highly unlikely that Charlotte had ever even had hold of his gun. I mean, she was in a scenario where even if that gun had fell on the floor, the likelihood of her picking it up, knowing how to hold it in such a confident manner that she's smugly smiling before she pulls the trigger, it's just straight out of a really crap B movie. And it just does not play into the reality that I think we're talking about right now. We get to November the 5th, 2007. I'll be honest, in this moment, everyone is shocked because everyone expects that Darren Mack is going to take the stand and is going to say how he's completely innocent and carry on this story about how he's the victim. But actually, before he's due to take the stand, he pleads guilty to first degree murder. Now, on one hand, we're all like, well, that's good because he should plead guilty to first degree murder. But the reality is there is some method in that because he knows that that's going to give him a better chance of parole. Now, his family and friends, they all believe that this is crazy because they said that he really wanted to tell his story. They were really surprised by his decision. And also he goes on and takes an Alfred plea. So this is the alpha plea, which is in relation to the attempted murder of Judge Weller. Now, an alpha plea is where you, as a defendant, agree that there's enough evidence to lead to a conviction. So essentially, it's a guilty plea. This is where the defendant doesn't actually admit that they carried out the crime. So it's like, OK, I accept the guilty plea to some... So it's basically like, OK, I agree that you would definitely send me down for this, but I'm not actually admitting that I did do it. So that's how the alpha plea plays out. Now, 
At this point, obviously, it means that they can go to sentencing. It's as simple as that. The guy has admitted that he's guilty, albeit kind of half-wise when it comes down to the Judge Weller charge. But three weeks later, Darren Mack fires Chesnoff and Freeman. And he says at this point, I want to withdraw the guilty plea. He says that the lawyers only ever cared about the money. And once they'd had his money, Darren Mack said that they told him there was absolutely no hope. Therefore, he should accept the plea deal. Just going to suggest, maybe, Mr. Mack, that was the right advice. We'd looked at your case. You obviously have to pay us because we're lawyers. We're looking at your case. That's how it works. It's called transactional. You hire us. We do our work. We tell you the truth. We're telling you. You haven't got a hope in hell. I accept the plea deal. I am a martyr. I am a sacrificial. Just accept the plea deal. Just accept the plea deal. I will give you some kind of reimbursement if you shut up and just accept the plea deal. But apparently, because he's gone ahead and done that, he's now like, hey, <laughs> I don't think things work this way. I want it to work differently. I want it to be reversed and I'm not accepting the guilty plea any longer. I imagine the individual who had to confirm with him that that's not how the system works. I'm sorry. You know, when you admit guilt, we have a bit of a problem in the fact that you admitted guilt and therefore you are now going to be sentenced, even though you've decided that you want to say that that didn't happen because it did happen. But this is what he does. And again, you're seeing the narcissism play out. So now he hires a new attorney, a guy called William Rootsis. And he said that when Darren Mack actually agreed all of this, he'd been confused, he'd been sleep deprived and he'd been dehydrated when accepting the deal. I've just had a baby, I'm quite sleep deprived. I'm often confused just on a general level. And sometimes I forget to have a cup of tea, but it wouldn't make me go, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to agree I'm guilty. Did you do it? Nah, I didn't, I didn't do any of it, but I'm just so confused and knackered and I could really do the Diet Coke. You know, this doesn't happen. But anyway, this attorney, William Roots, says, you know, at the end of the day, with those three issues, we want to have a retrial. So there was actually a hearing for the motion to withdraw the guilty plea and at this point, a massive mistake has been made. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. I should be very serious, but I can't help it because when a perpetrator is this stupid, it kind of warms my soul. Bear in mind, Charles has been murdered. A judge has nearly been killed. And there is a girl, a child growing up now without the parents because of the actions of Darren Mack. So I do feel that there is a level of acceptability at finding his idiocy quite brilliant because now he's fired Shesnoff and Freeman, his prior attorneys, they can be called to take the stand. Yeah, because he's got rid of them. He's basically waived his right to the attorney-client privilege. And whoa, super incriminating. So those two lawyers who were like, oh, <laughs> You're telling us that we just took the money. You're telling us we didn't do a good job. You're suggesting that we're the reason that you want this retrial because we just advised you correctly. Right, mate. Now, there's no attorney-client privilege. We are going to do our worst. So he hadn't thought that one through. And one of the revelations that they speak out about was that Darren Mack had actually put his knee on Charlotte's head after stabbing her, that she was gurgling, that she was bleeding out as she was dying. Also, Darren Mack never even mentioned a gun when he was first telling his former attorney about the events of the day of the murder. It's just something that he brings in after. And when he does mention the gun, he tells them that he'd thrown it in a dumpster. So the attorney obviously goes and looks in the dumpster or for a dumpster because it's been described in the area where Darren Mack has described it to be. So he wants to go and get it back because that would mean that there would be incriminating evidence about Charlotte on it, as in she tried to pull the trigger. Also, another piece of information that came to light was that Darren Mack had previously looked into a murder for hire. Probably not the best thing to have discussed with your past attorneys, because it kind of says that you really are somebody with malevolent, murderous intent. It's not going to look good for you, is it? Now, when Darren Mack takes this down, he said, listen, I was coerced into taking this plea deal. He said that he had been, and this really offends me. This is probably why I take a little bit of joy in 
dissecting the reality of what he's trying to put forward versus what is truth. He describes what he'd been through as a psychological rape, saying that he had newfound compassion for women who had actually been physically raped because it's not only the rape, but the will that's taken from them. So he's now implying not only is he a victim, he's a victim who can understand not only being a martyr and a sacrificial lamb, but also being a victim of violent sexual rape. How on earth can anybody be this absolutely self-obsessed and egotistical to the degree that I'm talking about where he's concerned? I mean, when you are physically raped, you have the physical scars along with the mental scars. So he has no consideration for the actual parallel he's drawing and just how far away from reality it truly is. In fact, it's like saying, they said, no, I couldn't do that. And so therefore I now feel violated and raped, but they just said, no, yes, they said no. And if you don't agree with everything that I say and do, if you don't give me exactly what I want, if you don't let me have what I demand, then you are psychologically raping me. I'm pretty sure that the way you just described those particular features, it's you who sounds a little bit on the rapey side in that moment. Anyway, they get to the outcome of the hearing and the request for the withdrawal of his pleas are denied. Of course they're denied. So then we get to February 2008, this is at the point where Darren Mack is sentenced and he gets life in prison. Now for Charlotte's murder, he received life in prison. That was with the possibility of parole after 20 years. A lot of people might think that he shouldn't have had the possibility of parole at all. And then for the shooting of Judge Weller, he actually received the maximum sentence of life in prison with the possibility of parole after eight years. Now for the use of a deadly weapon, in this instance, he gets sentenced to a duplicate sentence. So these charges basically mean that they will run consecutively. So that means he's gonna serve a minimum of 36 years in prison before being eligible for parole. That means he'll be eligible at 81 years of age in 2042. That would be his first possible chance of release. So if he does ever walk the streets again, the likelihood is he won't be a threat to society anymore. And there's a strong possibility he actually won't be leaving prison ever. Well, aside from in a box. I have no doubt whatsoever that Darren Mack is guilty as hell, but we have to remember that whilst we focus on the perpetrator, the victim in this case is Charlotte and in fact, Judge Weller. But Charlotte's presence is missed hugely. And Charlotte's mother has actually said that Darren Mack hypnotised himself into believing he's justified and that he's the victim. And she also talks about the fact that her life has never been the same again, never will be the same again. She misses her daughter with an absolute sense of loss that is totally profound and consuming. Joan Mack, so that's Darren Mack's mother, and Surya Townley, who's Charlotte's mother, they actually both share custody of Erica. And I think that's so positive. I think that it must be really difficult for both sides because I'm sure that each side believes the narrative that they choose to believe. And I think that would be probably very challenging for Charlotte's family. But it's important to remember that Erica has been a huge victim in this. She's lost her mother physically forever. She's never gonna see her again. She can see her father, of course she can, but he has broken and breached a boundary that is probably so profound that it will be very difficult for her to have a relationship with him in the future. But having the grandparents and being able to be loved by both parties, I think that's so important. And I hope that Erica has grown into a really well-adjusted, happy individual because she certainly deserves to. Now, when it comes down to Charlotte's family, 590 million was actually awarded to her estate and to Erica. And the reason for that was they pushed a wrongful death suit against Darren Mack. And I understand that because essentially the one thing that he didn't want to lose was money. So the one thing that actually would cost him hugely emotionally, psychologically, and also economically is money. Now, Darren Mack claims that he pled guilty because he was manipulated. And he's also trying to appeal his conviction. Of course he is. There's no way he wants to spend his life in prison. All of his appeals have been denied so far. That is unsurprising, isn't it? Darren's son, Jory, I will tell you, he still argues that his father is partially innocent. And even though I think that Darren Mack is completely 
guilty. I can also understand the perspective of his son. I can understand the perspective of looking from the outside and then thinking, well, you know what? Charlotte used to scream at my father. Charlotte wasn't perfect in the relationship. Charlotte could have got angry and been negative towards my dad that day. And that may have provoked my father. I can understand the idea of his father being partially innocent. But even if his father had a motivation to be angry with Charlotte, even if there was that partial understanding that we could give and the partial empathy with the situation that played out, he's still a murderer. And it's something that I understand a child who loves you would struggle coming to terms with. And I hope that Jury etc. has been able to find a position where he can still love his dad and have a relationship with his dad and see the best in his dad in spite of his actions. Remember, bear in mind, he was only 17 when his stepmom was murdered by his father. Now, Jory argues that the way that his father would actually be exonerated to some degree was if they found that gun that Darren used to carry, because that would prove self-defense because Charles' DNA would be on it. But of course, what we know from the attorneys who were representing him is that they couldn't find the dumpster and they couldn't find the gun. And I think the belief is that's because it genuinely wouldn't have proved anything and that Darren Mack knows it wouldn't have proved anything. Joan, his mother, well, she also believes that the murder was self-defence because that's what he tells her. She said she'd never caught him in a lie growing up, so she listens to what he claims to be the truth now. I will tell you that if you are an absolutely brilliant liar, people will believe you even when you are lying. So just because you didn't catch him in a lie when he was growing up doesn't mean he wasn't lying to you. Certainly, it wouldn't surprise me if an individual like Darren Mack was incredibly good at manipulation. And it's incredibly easy for a murderer to manipulate their own family members who love them into believing that they've been unjustly convicted. And I have total sympathy and empathy with those individuals. I understand why, as a mother, you would fully want to believe your child, even in the face and weight of evidence against them. They would want to hear, and I would want to hear as a mother, that my child was not a cold-blooded murderer. And for them, they don't want to see Darren Mack as that. So they believe what he's told them, even when those lies are unsubstantiated. The reality is that's what drives them to still connect with him. You know, you have to say to yourself, it's common sense and logic that Darren would not have thrown the gun away if he thought it would prove the self-defense claim. And it also seems highly unlikely that Darren Mack would ever have been able to stab Charlotte to death if she had indeed been holding that gun. There are too many inconsistencies, too much fabrication, and the weight of evidence is so hugely compelling that I have to believe that in this case, Darren Mack is guilty as hell. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Like I said, I think a lot of us can relate to the contentious issues that divorce present. I think lots of us can relate to those moments where you're incandescent with rage with an ex, but we draw the line at harming them. And we draw the line at planning demise of an individual who's set to preside over the courts and deal with the case that we're bringing to court where our children and our finances are concerned. That is not something that would even cross your mind. And let's take it to the extreme, and it does cross your mind. That's where it ends, in your head, imagining what you might like to do, but knowing morally what's right and wrong and staying within the law because of that. Unlike Darren Mack, who broke every moral, ethical, and legal law when it came down to the murders of Sharla and the attempted murder of Judge Weller. Be safe, guys. Join me next time. See you again. Take care. <laughs>